Paul, before we talk about the story, I want to talk about the period, about what was happening in 1950, post-war, pre-ready-to-wear designer fashion. Why is this period so good for this kind of story? Oh, I'm glad you asked, John. <laughs> um, well, um, <clears throat> just after the war, um, there, were, there were two places where fashion was, um, was going strong. Paris and London, but Paris was really excelling because a lot of the designers had kind of laid low and, and right, right after the war they were able to kind of emerge immediately and, and come up with some pretty great stuff. Obviously the list is long, the stuff, the dresses that we all kind of know. If you've ever seen a picture of a great dress in history, it's a Dior, Dior Balenciaga, um, going further into Givenchy and stuff like that, but um, the those were great designers, but the people that made the dresses were um, were there. They were available to them. In London, there was a little bit of a, a stutter start at, uh, uh, after the war. I mean, rationing was still there, even though maybe the designers weren't beholden to that kind of stuff that they were really trying to, the government was always trying to sort of push to sort of make certain wools and fabrics and stuff like that so that they could kind of get a foothold back into the industry. And that's where our guy is. Um, and we decided to set our story in 55, which was just after rationing, just sort of far enough away from the war that you could kind of have the hangover of it a little bit still, but not have to really address um, it too much, because our story was occupied with something else. Do you start thinking about this romance from the very beginning, and then it becomes a fashion designer, or do they become one and the same very early on? No, uh, it, uh, that's the order. It was a love story and a relationship movie first, uh, and the nature of their relationship was obvious uh, to me that it was a, a man of 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 of, kind of of great fussiness, mm -hmm. um, of of sing singular and kind of self obsessed and possessed, and that what would happen when his life is sort of interrupted by love in a way that kind of um, that makes for a good dramatic story. So we were in search of a job for this character and um, all signs started pointing towards making it a, a fashion designer because it, it could give us some good, uh, you know, good costumes, good production value. <laughs> so Mark, you have worked with uh, Paul on pretty much everything he's ever done, correct? This seems like an assignment that is both gratifying and terrifying because were it a composer, he is asking you to write a symphony and, and this character is gonna be a great musician. As a designer, you're gonna to have to come up with a wardrobe and designs that justify his renown. So what is your starting point for the work that this character is going to do? Where do you start deciding what his style is going to be? You know, I think at first we, I came over and looked at the things that you'd been looking at and kind of what captured your imagination. And uh, luckily I had a script to work with too and figured out what the major sort of beat gowns or outfits would be. And, uh, and then, you know, he's got things that he's interested in and I'll go away and do some more research and come back and say, well, how about this? Or how about if we approach this? A certain way, and uh, and then put that together in a visual book, and and yes, no, m maybe, and then w I think we took it to Daniel to look at as well in New York at that point, right? We realized pretty early on that it wouldn't be the traditional thing where Mark and I might be collaborating on the costumes. That there was a triangle that we have Daniel playing a costume designer. He's gonna have something to say about it, right? So it was a kind of, so of we we have we had to kind of find a way for the three of us to work, which actually ended up being really easy. But it was just, you know, you look at all these dresses and the, the inspirations, and the inspirations might have been initially like a Balenciaga, but that was much very sculpted stuff. Charles James really sculpted stuff. And the one thing I remember us saying early on was like, right, we're not making a movie about the world's greatest fashion designer, you know, because we wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. very, very English. And what does that mean? So that means tweeds, and that means sort of um, the, the creative, the creative um, inspirations that are coming out of this man. And Daniel could sort of start to fill in those inspirations, and, and Mark would sort of then interpret them and bring them to life. So, At what point do you decide it's not going to be chic? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck chic. I mean, chic, I know, but I it's, know, a, yeah, it's an so. important point in the, in the story. <laughs> and what, how, how would you define that in your conversations? How do you define fuck chic? What is that not going to be in terms of what he is not going to do as a designer? 
we weren't allowed to say the word chic, so we didn't. Really <laughs> but it, but it's also it's you know I love the idea that sort of films kind of unfold. Mm -hmm. You know, every decision influences the next decision, kind of. And I thought that we went on this weird road of of looking at inspiration and then seeing what we had or finding a new garment or something to be inspired by and then including Daniel in on the conversation and look at this fabric and what did he think of things and so it it really there's no seed of any one garment it's a lot of interesting influence but I think the other thing that started to happen is that you can have all of these ideas and maybe you're pulling inspiration from historical that's one thing and then it starts to get even more because maybe you're thinking about stealing or combining two different dresses that you've seen historically when it starts to get more interesting is when we sort of had an atelier to build these costumes and you're actually then making up ideas based on these fabrics or laces and then to take it a step further it became even more interesting when the casting has happened because then you're sort of you're also shaping ideas to the women who are going to wear these dresses because the dresses were great, but when they're laying on the floor, there's just like a pile of fabric. But when it's on somebody, it really becomes a dress. And so once we started to, once we had Vicky and there was her shape, everything, everything just comes out of like, oh, this is a great dress, or that's historical, or whatever it was, and it starts to become slowly its own creation, which is really, that's when it really started to get really fun. Where did you find Vicky, and what did you need for your actor to play Alma? We found her in a tea shop in the north of London. <laughs> no, we found her. <laughs> um, Daniel and I fantasized about what we wanted, and what we wanted was um, somebody, f a European, sort of Eastern European, perhaps, somewhere from over there, certainly an immigrant to England at that time. Um, I started keeping my eyes open and I saw a movie that Vicky made called The Chambermaid, uh, which I really enjoyed. And then in the traditional way of casting, C Cassandra Kulakundas, our casting director, uh, asked sort of women between a certain age and a certain uh, background to audition. And then the one of the very early on a tape came in that was Vicky's and it was like a you know, classic uh, case of stop looking, you know, stop looking. That's that just, she seemed to be so um, perfect. And I don't think we realized just how perfect it was. She was perfect in the way that she looked and the way that these words came out of her in a kind of determination. And she's here, so I shouldn't say a lot of them. It's okay. But, um, and then to meet her was kind of further proof that she's just as uh, strong-willed, determined, bossy, and all the rest as Alma. So she <laughs> and that probably comes in handy when you're acting opposite Somebody like Daniel, who's going to be very forceful in his performance. I don't. There's maybe a better word for it, but would you describe what it was like acting opposite Daniel, and how much of Alma was part of you acting opposite this very strong-willed actor? Um, it was a uh, it was a challenge to work with him, of course, and uh, you know I think it's really difficult for me to to give the right answer because I was only trying to to react, or, you know, because obviously he was preparing so well in such a long time and I, I didn't prepare. Or I, I prepared a little bit on my side, but I couldn't rehearse or anything. And um, so I decided to take it from the place uh, that was left for me, which was no place, you know what I mean? So I, t I, t I tried to be open and and completely not really know what I'm doing you know to to rely on my instinct and that's what I did so I don't really know how it was to to work with him because I was with, with Reynolds the whole time it was always Reynolds and uh, I was just trying to to react yeah when you come on Dylan how far in the process is the film and at what point are you starting to hear Johnny's music as well uh, Paul and I talk and hang out before shooting, but uh, when shooting starts, um, I start. And uh, looking at stuff and um, talking to Paul and uh, kind of putting things together and making sure um, everybody has what they need. Uh, so I was in London for the shoot. Um, 
Johnny's, um, we, I mean, I, when I walked in, I think we had 20 cues that Paul's, oh, uh, Johnny did a new thing I got this morning, and he'll just send it. And it's incredibly inspiring. Because he's, Johnny watches dailies too. We give him sets of dailies as we go. Um, but I think it's late in the, in the process when he starts to sort of compose to picture, if he ever does. It's more from talking to Paul, from knowing the script, and from feeling. And I think he does stuff um, bouncing off Paul that we end up with a whole treasure trove of stuff that, you know, immediately uh, several genius things pop to the top and, whoa, this is great, this is great. The kind of theme for the movie, the riddle piano thing is came early on in its initial form. And I, I love that way of working with music, actually, that it doesn't get sort of nailed to picture that it's a song, that it's a feeling from the composer, like a performance from an actor, like words from the writer, you've got this other thing that, um, you know, sometimes it knows where it wants to go, but other times we're just trying it out. Let's try this here, let's try that there. Um, and it's a great malleable back and forth where uh, notes go to him and cues come back and we just bat it back and forth. I wanna talk about some specifics about the design. The seamstresses who are building some of these um, clothes look like, to me, real seamstresses. Did you actually cast people who had built clothes and knew the way in which that style of clothing would have been made by hand? Yeah, that's right. Um, it's a combination. Um, Nana and Biddy, if you remember the two older women, they're, they're, they, um, we met them at the VNA. They're um, volunteers there, but um, they worked for Hardy Amy's 60s, maybe 60s, 50s, late 50s, 60s. Um, and then, and they were super helpful, and then so charismatic that we also gave them <laughs> sizable roles. And then all the background is a combination of actresses with sewing experience. Mm -hmm. You know, you have like resumes, and at the bottom it's like horseback riding, <laughs> like sewing. And so it was, um, we had them, and they, they but, in the foreground were, were a real set of hands who were actually some of the sewers who made the actual costumes. I mean, So they're building uh, costumes on camera. They're, well, worse than that, they're building costumes <laughs> the night before until like 5 o'clock in the morning, finishing it, coming to the set at 8 with no sleep, and then being asked to do it again rip for it the apart. camera, rip it apart and do it again for the camera. So yeah, that, and yeah, that's why they look so tired. Thank you for bringing us your film. Thank you, John. Thank you.